Good afternoon, good evening, everyone, no matter where you are in the world. My name is Maria, and I am thrilled to be here with you today. Um, thank you so much to GMAT Club for asking me here and inviting me here to speak with you. Um, for those of you who are maybe a little bit new to the MBA admissions consulting game, uh, MBA admissions consultants of my caliber usually charge at least $300 per hour for their time. Uh, and so GMAT Club, however, has managed to convince some of us to give you a lot of our best tips and information for free, which is awesome of them. So if right now or if at any point during today's session you think what I'm saying is useful, let's let GMAT Club know so that way they will continue doing things like this. Uh, give us a big like down below. There should be like a little like button. So give us a like uh, and then that will sort of say to them like, hey, GMAT Club, thank you for thank you for hosting this session. So let us jump right in. Okay, so today we are going to be talking about something that I call the ADCOM hierarchy of needs. But first of all, who am I? Hi, my name's Maria. Uh, I'm a 2005 graduate of Harvard Business School, and I am the founder of applicantlab.com, uh, which is an online tool that is a virtual MBA admissions consultant. So now you don't have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars to get great advice. You can get great advice from me for a fraction of the price. Hi, Maria. What are you yes. doing, bro? Have you shared your presentation? I it don't says I'm sharing screen. Oh, sorry. No, that's not. Screen sharing tips. Just click on share screen button. Did you see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, guys. I'm having a technical difficulty. Screen to see your screen. Yes, allow. Oh, no. It's. Oh, it says. Oh, no. I'm using Firefox. It says Firefox cannot allow permanent oh, access yeah. to your screen. Yeah, yeah. Firefox doesn't support. Oh, I am so sorry, everyone. Wait, if I use uh, Microsoft Edge, will that work? Do you have Google Chrome? I, you know what? Chrome was being really buggy with me the other day, and so I, um, I uninstalled it, but I could reinstall it real quick. Oh no, I had no idea that this was gonna that Firefox wouldn't. Work. I actually looked up. I googled beforehand. I'm like, the Streamyard, because the software we're using right now is called Streamyard. I was like, does Streamyard work with? Um, with uh, Firefox, and it said, yes, it works with all browsers except for Safari. So uh, I don't know, Abhijit, let me, you know what? Let me try, should I try using this on uh, Inter Internet, in Explorer. Internet Explorer while I, while I try to kind of re, uh, let's see. Okay, okay, hold on. You know what? I just was able to reinstall Chrome. Sorry, everyone. Uh, so let me just let me just copy and paste this URL over and then see if that works instead. Okay, just give me one second. Sorry for your patience, everyone. Actually, should I just start over again or should I just pick up where I left off? It says your browser can't access your devices. Okay, so Abhijit, when I when I switch to the other browser, should I just start over at the beginning and we'll sort of you can you can just uh, show the presentation as um, you can start from here. okay okay sorry everyone thanks for your patience I Okay, can you see me now? Yes. Okay. Please share your screen. Okay, okay, let's see if it works, fingers crossed. Okay, yes, application window, PowerPoint slideshow, let's do it. Yes, okay, I am so sorry about that, everyone. You know, technology, we think it's perfect and then it does things like this, so apologies for that. Uh, once again, I am Maria, Harvard Business School, 2005, applicantlabfounder.com. You already knew that part. So, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to start with the key pieces of an application. If you've been on my webinars before, you have already, like, seen this, but there's going to be a different angle to it in just a second. So, for people who have never joined my webinars before, I am going to go through this just so we are all on the same page. So, when we talk about the MBA application... There are lots of little pieces of it that you, lots of little things that you are going to submit when you apply to business school. So one of those things are your GMAT or GRE test scores, your undergraduate and graduate school GPA, 
Uh, you will have to write one or more essays. You will need a resume. You will need uh, one or more, usually two letters of recommendation. These, both the resume and the recommendation are the topics of my previous uh, webinars here. There's also these little short answers in the application form. And should your application form be successful, you will then be invited to interview. Now, people sort of realize that all, these are all of the discrete different pieces of the MBA application, but what people don't realize is that there are sort of invisible elements that flow through all of these different pieces, such as your career vision. What is it you want to do in the world? Why do you need an MBA to get there? You might not need an MBA to get there. And why is this school the right school for you to do that? And at the center of it all is leadership, proving that you are someone who can get things done through others. And all of these pieces flow together if the if one piece is out of sync with the other the machinery of your application will come screeching to a grinding halt and how important are these different pieces i i am not going to go through this i'm going to sort of you know we've we've done we've done this in a little more detail in some other webinars but here you can see what they did uh what gmac did the people who issue the gmac exam they asked admissions uh board members how much weight would you give to each of these pieces? And so you can see that the test scores are 20%, the GPA is 18%. And then on the right-hand side, you'll see the interview, resume, essays, recommendations, and short answers. Those are, each individual one is around like say 10, 15, 11, 15, 21%. But when you combine them together, all of these things on the right-hand side of the screen they add up to a significant percentage. They add up to around 60%. So the 60% on the right-hand side of the screen, those are the intangible or um, what, how should I say this? These are not the things that are hard numbers, right? The GPA and the GMAT, those are things that define you in terms of numbers. The elements on the right-hand side are the softer elements, right? What type of a person are you? What type of a leader are you? And that personality part, that subjective element of your application is what comes through on the things on the right-hand side. And you'll notice that in total, the things on the right-hand side add up to about 60-ish 60, 60 percent. And so that's three times more important than the GMAT score alone. And so why is this important? Because what we're going to talk about today is what is it that admissions officers look for? And not only like, oh, they allocate sort of this much percentage to this piece and then this much percentage to this piece, but it's not just sort of a, a, a static thing where there are different buckets that they look at all at once. They actually look at these things in different order, right? They are not all considered in the same order or simultaneously at the same time. And that is what we're going to talk about today. So let's start off with, we're going to start off with this concept that you might have heard of if you ever took a psychology class. It is called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. And there's a little picture of Abraham Maslow. How you doing, man? Uh, and this is a very famous psychologist who figured out that as human beings, before we advance to our next level of, you know, self-fulfillment, certain base needs have to be met before we can move up in terms of our, you know, feeling feeling uh, self-fulfilled. So it's gonna be a pyramid and you need to satisfy one level before you move up and can worry about the others. So the first one is physiological needs, right? So that is like things like, do you have food? Do you have shelter? Do you have oxygen? Uh, the next one is safety, right? Are there wolves chasing you? Is there uh, an opposing tribe <laughs> coming after you with axes and bows and arrows? Uh, then after we after our basic physical needs are met and as long as we feel safe then we can start to think about bringing things like love and feeling like we're part of a family or part of a community into our lives then from there we start to develop self-esteem and then the very top pinnacle of the pyramid is this concept called self-actualization and so what matters here is not what the different words mean but it's more this concept that you know, you cannot reach sort of this own self-actualization, being one with the universe, being mindful, whatever, if there's a pack of wolves chasing you <laughs> down here, right? So if we look at safety, you're not gonna get up here if you're running away from someone trying to kill you. So that is my very, very uh, amateur <laughs> explanation of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you were a psychology major and I butchered that, please um, 
be nice to me. So the reason I talked about this is because the admissions committees at business schools also have a similar hierarchy of needs. That is, you need to prove things in a certain order in order for your candidacy to advance. So what are those things? At the very bottom of the pyramid, and we're going to go through each of these in more detail. At the very bottom of the pyramid, we've got academics. Then we've got EQ. If, uh, if you haven't encountered the term EQ before, it stands for emotional quotient as opposed to IQ, which stands for intellectual quotient. This is a measure of like how smart are you in terms of basic people skills. Uh, then they think about your ability to be employed. And then finally at the top is this kind of fuzzy concept known as leadership potential. Uh, and so when you see people, for example, on message boards, like the GMAT Club message boards, you might occasionally see some postings that look a little bit like this. I've got a 780 on the GMAT, which is almost a perfect score, and I have a 4.0 perfect GPA, but I was rejected from this business school. Ah, what the heck? How is that possible? Look at how good my scores are. What? How could they reject me? And the answer is that having a high GMAT and a high GPA is wonderful. And it certainly helps a lot, but notice that the academic credentials, the intellectual credentials are at the very bottom of the pyramid. So that's just the beginning. So if you ever see uh, some posting like that on a GMAT club or whatever, think to yourself, aha, this person cleared that bottom hurdle of the academics, but something higher up on the pyramid is probably what did them in. So what we're gonna now delve into is I'm gonna talk about what are those different facets of the pyramid? How can you prove that you meet uh, these requirements? And, you know, I'm going to give you some more descriptions. So then that way, as you start to assemble your applications in the coming months, you can start to think about what are you presenting about yourself? Uh, and what are you sort of maybe not focusing so much on uh, in order to show the admissions committee that you meet all of the facets of the pyramid? So let's start with academics. First of all, why do academics even matter, right? I hear this sometimes people say, oh, you know, why the GMAT? Why do these admissions committees even care about how I did on some stupid GMAT test? And on the one hand, I, I understand that. Uh, but on the other hand, even though business school is not nearly as hard as other types of graduate school, it is a breeze compared to, say, medical school or law school, it's still school. And the first question an admissions committee wants to know is, can this candidate handle the work at our school? Because a couple of things. First of all, a lot of MBA programs uh, have very quantitative classes, right? They, you, many schools will have uh, in the first year statistics, microeconomics, accounting, finance, operations slash supply chain. These are all very uh, quantitative heavy subjects. And so not only will you be taking sort of this heavyish course load, but there is so much non-classroom stuff that is going to take up your time and your life. For example, recruiting for jobs, clubs, your social life, recruiting for jobs, and finally recruiting for jobs. So this is why they want to make sure that not only can you handle the work, but can you handle the work given that you're not going to be able to dedicate your entire existence, your 24 hours a day to the academics, right? You, I mean, the point, the reason you're going to business school, frankly, is to get a better job, right? So if you go to business school and you only study and you're trying so hard to study and it takes you like two hours to do a problem set that other people are doing in 20 minutes, that's time that you're going to spend waste because you're not going to be recruiting. So you might not end up getting that job. So they want to make sure not only can you handle the coursework, but can you do this work relatively quickly under some relative time pressure? As a side note, psst, here's a secret. I know sometimes in some countries, people feel that it's okay to like quit their jobs to study for the GMAT or to uh, write your essays, do not do that. US and European business schools look down upon that very severely. And when you think about it, it makes sense. After all, first of all, everyone else in the applicant pool is working full time and studying for the GMAT at once. So it's kind of an unfair playing field. But also, if you can't study for the GMAT and get a high score and handle work at the same time, how are you going to handle, in their minds, they're thinking, how are you going to handle all of this other stuff 
that we know is going to take up your life. So that is part of why this matters. They're not just doing it because they're snobs uh, and they like, you know, they like uh, making people miserable. And also on some level, if a candidate if a candidate is not getting a super high GMAT score, and that GMAT score really is a true indication of, you know, how they can perform certain, uh, you know, cognitive tasks under time pressure, a school might actually be doing a candidate a favor if they don't let them in. Because life is short. Take it from one of your elders. I'm in my mid-40s now. I am very old compared to you. Take it from me. Life is short. It goes by quickly. Don't torture yourself. So why would a candidate be or a student be tortured if they are let into a school uh, that perhaps is a little too rigorous for their innate abilities. First of all, you will be miserable. Uh, it stinks to be the person in the room who doesn't get it. Uh, it's you know it's not great for your self-esteem or your mental health. Your classmates are going to be miserable, right? Because whenever there's someone in the room who's academically weak, trust me, everyone else notices, right? So people are going to be like, oh, how did how did he get in? Oh my God, I worked so hard to get into this school, but they somehow let in this dummy, Ugh, right? And then also professors are going to be miserable because professors are going to say, look, I have a curriculum to get through. I have a syllabus to get through. We need to get through it quickly. But if I have to keep stopping to explain things over and over and over again, uh, the next time, you know, I need to go have a talk with the people of admissions because we definitely need to make sure that we're letting in people who are of a certain level of caliber. So how do you prove that you have the academic chops? So the biggest way to prove this is through that test score, that standardized test score. Uh, and so people sometimes think like, well, my, my GMAT wasn't so hot, Maria, but, you know, I did really well in college. The thing is, the standardized test score is a little bit more relevant because of the word standardized, right? I didn't go to your college. You didn't go to my college. I didn't major in what you majored in, right? So there's a very big difference. Sometimes people, they, this is so silly. When they look at that average GPA for a school and they're like, oh, the average GPA is a 3.6. I have a 3.9, so I'm in the clear. Or, oh, I have a 3.1, so I'm doomed. Nope, neither one of those is accurate because a 3.9 in, say, I don't know, what's something really easy to study? Communications, right? Like, what are some fluffy majors? A 3.9 in a super fluffy major is not going to be as well respected as a 3.1 in neuroscience artificial intelligence, something super intense, right? So since your college and my college and your major and my major were not the same, we're not identical, how can an admissions office compare apples to oranges? They don't have to. They compare apples to apples by having everyone take a standardized test. So you and I don't have the same college experience at all, but we're both taking the same or at least the same version of the test. The JMAT or GRE, whichever one you take, is the great equalizer, right? And so this is actually good news because the GMAT and GRE can balance each other out. This is especially uh, useful. A lot of times applicants are very concerned. They are overly concerned about their low GPAs. And yes, a very, very bad GPA can be disastrous. But people are like, oh, I only have a 3.4 and the average is a 3.6. Ooh, am I in trouble? You're not in trouble. A lower than average GPA can be easily balanced out by a GMAT score. If you rock that GMAT, you've proven to the admissions committee, boom, I can handle whatever you throw at me. So the important thing in terms of academics, if we think back to that pyramid, is you have to cross the hurdle. You have to clear the hurdle to show them and make them feel safe and assured that you're not going to like fail out and spiral out of control and be miserable, right? So it doesn't matter if you cross that hurdle in their in their mind, if you cross it by like an inch or if you cross it by a meter, uh, you just have to cross it, right? So that's sort of that bottom of the pyramid. And so by crossing that that hurdle, you're sort of telling them like, okay, like now I've let them know that I am not going to like, you know, kill myself because first semester to, 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 uh, statistics is going to be too complicated for me. Um, now then, after that, in terms of the academics, like, yes, if you are from a more competitive pool, like, say, Indian engineers or finance bros or whatever, in or uh, like an MBB, like a strategy consultant, for example, those, it does help to have a higher GMAT score in those cases, not because they, they care about the hurdle, but because when they're looking at 500 people whose resumes are all essentially identical <laughs> and they tend to have higher 
you know, people from those overrepresented groups tend to have higher GMAT scores. So then you will have to sort of aim for something higher than average, but it's okay. As long as you cross the hurdle, your candidacy will move to that next level of consideration. And what is that next level of consideration? Well, it is EQ, emotional quotient, on a very basic level. Are you a, are you a good person? Are you nice? And right now you're like, what, Maria? I want to go to business school to become like a Wall Street shark and make a lot of money. And why does it matter that I'm nice? Who cares about nice, right? All that matters is I can bring in the moolah. Well, hold on a second. Being nice matters while you're a student right? While you are a member of their campus community, you are going to have to get along with other people on class projects. Uh, there will be clubs, club projects, conferences to organize, et cetera, et cetera. So if they don't want someone to show up to their campus and everyone else is doing all the work for the conference, and then this one candidate is like off to the side, like, huh, I'm not going to contribute or, you know, being a jerk that no one else likes, right? So they want people on the campus who are going to be nice. And then after you graduate, you know, pleasant people are more likely to get promoted. Uh, and then promoted people are more likely to eventually move up that ladder in their careers and become VIPs, which is what every MBA program is drooling to get. And also, after you graduate, nice people tend to contribute more to the alumni community because you might hear this often. And if you haven't heard it, I will say it to reiterate it. The alumni network that you get from a school is one of the most valuable things you take away from your time there. So they're looking for people who are likely to give back to that alumni community. And on a more basic level, they want to make sure that you're not going to end up in jail. And if you're thinking to yourself, people who go to Harvard Business School don't end up in jail, Maria. Oh, no, they do. We actually, um, someone in my extended social circle just got out of jail earlier this year for securities fraud. So um, that's really bad for the school, right? Because then when this person was in the newspaper and they were in the local newspaper a lot when they got jailed for securities fraud, uh, it said, blah, 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 person, a graduate of Harvard Business School, right? And Harvard Business School does not want its name associated you know, it wants its name to be put in the news articles with amazing things like Sheryl Sandberg, the most powerful woman in business. She's a Harvard Business School you know, graduate. Let's focus, focus your attention over here. Don't focus on this guy over here who went to jail. So how do they figure out like EQ? How can they possibly figure out if I have this? Well, they figured it out in a couple of different ways. First of all, how you talk about yourself. First in the essays, and then if your essays and everything else is strong and you're then invited to interview, then in the interview. And so what I mean by this is if you write an essay where you are like, let me tell you about this project that I went, got put on. There was this guy who was so stupid and he was not pulling his weight and what an idiot. But thankfully, I was there. I stepped in and saved the day. Thank God for me. Woohoo. I'm awesome. If you tell the story, that's an exaggeration, of course, but if you tell the story in that way, it's going to be a huge turnoff to them because they're going to say, ha wait a second, is this person a jerk? <laughs> so the same story, the same accomplishment, right? Let's say you're thrown into a project, the project is in disarray, and you help clean it up, and you turn the team around, and you get things back on track. The way you describe that experience in your application matters. Do not be super arrogant or hogging all the credit or patting yourself on the back way too much. It's going to backfire. They're going to think, ooh, this person's not likable. And then, so even if you pass that first hurdle, if you come across as unlikable in your essays or and or in the interview, then forget it. You're not going to go any further. And then also how others talk about you. So this, by this, I mean your recommendation letters. So what does this mean? When you are getting your recommendations, have them focus on your EQ strengths and not your IQ strengths. I did, I think I did a, a, a video with GMAT Club a couple weeks ago on how to get strong recommenders. So I'm not going to repeat that here. But a big mistake I see people make is they go to their recommender and they say, hey, I am super good at coding uh, things in Python. And so I want you to write in your recommendation that Maria is the best Python coder I've ever met in my life. Her code is beautiful. It's well documented. It never breaks. There are no bugs. Who cares? That's not important to them. What's more important to them is Maria's a good person. And when she leads a team, people want to work with her. And then the next level of the pyramid is this concept called employability. And I know this seems kind of funny because we, uh, 
we were just talking about, like these sort of high level, like, are you a good person? Do you have empathy? Do you have compassion? Are you a strong team player? So it seems kind of silly to like go from like these sort of high level things to now this very down to earth <laughs> consideration. But after you prove that you're smart and that you're nice, then the question they're asking themselves is, are the recruiters that come to our campus to hire our students, are they going to love you? And if they're not gonna love you, do you have what it takes to network and get a job on your own? This matters because as you may have seen in a lot of these um, rankings, the MBA rankings, the post-graduation employment rate, they, they'll often say something like percent of the class that is employed three months after graduation, right? That statistic often plays a big part in the rankings. So the schools want to be certain that if you go to their school, that you're going to be hireable in the future. Um, and why is that? Because recruiting success becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy at a school, right? If a school attracts great students who become great job candidates, then great companies are going to want to come to campus right? The McKinsey's of the world, the, you know, Goldman Sachs of the world, whatever, they're going to say to themselves, wow, you know, every time we go to recruit students at X school, we love those kids. Let's get more. Let's hire more next year, right? And then what happens is that if great companies come to a campus and then that business school becomes famous for being a great feeder into certain firms, then they're going to attract the best candidates for business school. So the applicants are going to say, wow, I really want to work at Amazon. Ross, uh, University of Michigan Ross is one of the key feeders. They have one of the best rela corporate relationships to Amazon of any business school. So hmm, I'm, I wasn't considering Ross before, but since Amazon's where I want to work, I should probably, you know, I should apply to them. And so then the best candidates apply to the school, the best candidates get into the school, and then those people become the best job candidates. Um, so this is important for people be, for two levels. First of all, it's important because the career vision that you cite in your application has to be something realistic. I'm going to go into that. I think that's the topic of my next talk. And if not, I do a ton of that in applicantlab.com and you can see it for free as part of the free trial. You can see a lot of my advice uh, for this for free. Uh, but so that's why when you apply to business school, if you say, well, I want to come to your MBA program uh, because I want to become the CEO of three different Fortune 500 companies before the age of 28, the schools are going to be like, whoa, this person, they're not going to achieve that. And so yikes. Uh, this is also why people who have very short tenures at different jobs sometimes get an extra level of scrutiny. So for example, if someone, if you've had a job for like, let's say eight months, and then your next job was 12 months, and then your next job was seven months. Uh, at a certain point, they're going to ask themselves, first of all, is this person, what's the problem? Is it the company that's the problem or is it this person that's the problem? And they're going to put themselves in the employer's shoes and they're going to say, okay, how are our recruiting companies going to react to this candidate? In fact, I have, you know, I'm a member of, there's an organization called AGAC, A-I-G-A-C. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's like the elite admissions consultants organization. You have, in order to get in, you have to have all these certain uh, criteria. And so I'm a member of that, of that organization. And as part of that, I get to go meet with admissions officers at schools. And many schools have admitted that there have been times when they have been really excited about a candidate. And then they take that person's resume to the career services office. Usually career services and admissions are like on the same hallway. And so they'll be like, hey, if we let this person in, do you think they're going to get this job? And they will consult career services on your employability in terms of factoring that into the admissions decision. Uh, so if you have had some jumps in your career, just realize that you're going to need to be proactive in explaining that narrative. This is also why schools in the application form will usually ask if you have been unemployed for three months or more, explain why. So in the lab, I, I can't, I'm not gonna spend time talking about that now, but in the lab, I've got advice about that. So let's just take a, a quick pause from talking about the different steps in the pyramid. And I just wanna give a quick, quick side note about brand. So as you may know, 
there is no like licensing test at the end of business school. It's not like medical school where like you have to pass some sort of board exam or law school where you have to pass the bar. At least in the US, you have to pass the bar. And I'm sure it's something else in other countries, right? So at the end, there's no real way to say, um, you know, ha, 95% of our graduates passed the MBA licensing exam on their first try. And that's the proof that we are a wonderful school that doesn't exist in the MBA world. And so what then, if there's no like test that people can compare stats against, how do you differentiate one school from the other? It's the brand. In other words, what do other people think about our school? So admissions committees and schools are very cognizant of the fact that the people that they let in are their school, their program is not going to be judged. It could have the best teaching in the world. They could have the most engaging classes. They could have the most, you know, the most useful hands-on projects. But if those graduates go out into the world and don't give other people a good opinion of that school, it does not matter, right? So what impacts what people think about a school? Strong alumni. They want people who are preferably going to go on to be famous in a good way, not in a going to jail way. And people who are going to be preferably happy, so then that way they will donate money back to the school. Uh, they will, you know, when they get interviewed by Forbes or Fast Company or what have you, they say like, oh, you know, I really credit my success to the fact that I went to blah, blah, blah business school right? That's what a school is dying for. So they're trying to predict who are you going to be in 20 years? Are you going to be the one getting interviewed by Forbes? So what makes for strong alumni? Well, strong students. And what makes for strong students? Strong applicants. So the school, the reason why do they care about like the employee, but like, why do they care about all this stuff? Shouldn't, the only thing that matters is business school is how good I would be as a student of business, right? No, they are very cognizant of the fact that after you graduate from their school, you're going to go out into the world and that school name is going to be attached to you for the rest of your life. And so your actions are going to be um, fairly or unfairly are going to be measured against the name of that of that school. So if you go out into the world and you don't have that EQ and you're a jerk, let's say, and you're the only person from school X that people have interacted with, people are going to think like, oh, school X, man, they just let in a bunch of jerks. That is the last thing a school wants. So this becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? So that's why in your application, it's important to show them not so much I'm going to be a good student in your classroom tomorrow, but more I have the potential to be someone great in 20 years. So remember this, remember our little friend, the pyramid? So some of these things that we've been talking about map into uh, the act, you know, these different parts of the pyramid. So I'm going to be a, ha what makes me a happy graduate of a program? When I look back on my time in business school, when, when the, <laughs> when the request for the donation check comes in several times a year, the little envelope, it's like, please give us money. Um, what makes me happy about a school? Well, if I, if, when I went to school, did I have a manageable course load or was I miserable because it was like so over my head and I was up until three in the morning every night and I was crying. Um, do you like the people that I met there? That also defines whether or not I'm a happy alumnus or alumna. Did I get that job that I wanted? The whole reason of going to business school, I spent two whole years. I went $170,000 into debt, mostly because I wanted to get a better type of job. Did I get that good job? Um, so that's, they want to make sure that you're happy that you went there. And so then it becomes about, are you going to be the sort of person who goes on to make the school proud? And that's where the leadership potential comes in when they ask themselves, is this person going to be in Forbes in 20 years? And so now this is like sort of a frustrating thing because leadership potential, it's like, it's such like a fuzzy word, like leadership, oh, you know, it's so, it's difficult to define. It's not... It's not a concrete, tangible thing, right? So what does leadership potential even mean? I mean, come on, Maria, that's, this is ridiculous. How can an admissions committee possibly know which candidates are going to go on to be more successful in the future compared to others? The truth is they don't. There's no way they can know for sure, but they can try to guess. And how do they guess? They look at your past behavior and they believe that past behavior is an indication of future behavior. And so business schools themselves, most business schools have been around for at least 30, 50, maybe even 100 years. And so they, they track you. 
they are going to track you for the rest of your life. And they have tracked generations and generations of past alumni through their careers. Uh, and so they know which people from different classes go on to sort of rise through the ranks and which people maybe don't have that successful career outcome. And so they've realized that what makes people successful in the business world, it's not just about IQ, definitely not. There are a lot of brilliant genius people out there that everyone hates and therefore they might temporarily get away with stuff, but in the long run, no one wants to work with them. It's not about being an excellent individual contributor because you know whenever I get an assignment at work, I do it perfectly and it's amazing. That doesn't matter because in the long term, you're not going to get anywhere by yourself. You're going to have to work in teams. If you're a CEO, you're going to have to work with different people. It doesn't matter where you are in the business world. You're going to have to work with other people. Um, no one makes it to the top alone and no one, if they do make it to the top alone, they don't stay at the top alone. So leadership potential is about making good things happen, not by yourself, but through other people. So leadership to me means being a positive change agent who steps forward to solve problems, who doesn't just sit around and wait for like good assignments to come to them. This is someone who says, you know what? There's something wrong over here. It's not great. I'm gonna, no one's fixed it yet. I'm gonna fix it. This is ridiculous. So these are people who take the initiative to step forward and they do so in a way that gets the best out of other people along the way. They don't alienate other people. Uh, they don't you know, stab other people in the back, et cetera, et cetera. So for me, and I teach this, I go into more detail of this in Applicant Lab, but what are the three key ingredients for me of leadership? And I've been doing admissions consulting now for over 15 years. I've had a lot of time <laughs> to think about what is leadership and you know, what is, what is it? So here's, after many years of reflection, I have broken down leadership into three core ingredients. My opinion is that leadership, one piece of it is innovation, right? Thinking up better ways to do things, questioning the status quo, saying like, you know, is that, that, that reason, that thing they do, it just, it's not, it's not great. Um, so I think it could be better. And to be clear, when I say innovation, you don't, don't panic if you haven't invented the iPhone. Right? You don't have to be Steve Jobs. It can be a small scale improvement. The important thing, though, is that you're someone who's thinking of new and better ways to do things. Then initiative, right? The best idea in the world doesn't mean anything if you just sort of sit back and you're like, well, I sure wish they would ask me to overhaul our hiring process. But until they ask me, I'm just going to sit here and look at Facebook. Like, no, they're looking for people who step forward and are like, you know what, guys, this could be better. Let's do it. And then finally, persuasion. Because just like the best idea in the world doesn't matter if it only lives in your head and you don't step forward to volunteer to lead it. Um, if you can't persuade other people to follow you, then the idea is going to die on the vine. So innovation, initiative, and persuasion for me are the three key ingredients to, to proving that you have that top of the pyramid leadership. So in your application, you're going to want to focus on times that you have demonstrated these specific brand traits, uh, in my humble opinion. So what does this mean? This means if you if you have like a if you came up with like a, an idea, here's what I, here's my example. If you came up with an idea that increased your company's revenue by X, but it was your idea, and then you went to your boss and said, "Hey, boss, let's do this." Let's say it increased the company's revenue by X. If your boss came to you and said, hey, you, I want you to work on this project. I want you to do X, Y, and Z. Go do it. And that increased the company's revenue by 10x. I would rather have you tell the story with the smaller tangible outcome, with a smaller dollar amount, but the one in which you demonstrated more innovation and more initiative. And this is counterintuitive because sometimes applicants think, well, I worked on one project that was a million dollars and I worked on another project that was $20 million. So I should definitely focus on the $20 million project, not necessarily. Ask yourself when you start to write your essays and you start to ask your recommenders which stories you want them to write about you, when have I demonstrated these three pieces of leadership? So you want to demonstrate one or more of these ingredients to prove that you're at the top of that pyramid. So at work, there are different ways to start to, to prove that you're a leader, um, or you can start to develop these now. I mean, we are a little bit early. It's now March, so uh, at the time of this recording. So you still got about six months or nine months before the round one and round two deadlines, respectively. 
So you can get started tomorrow at work. Uh, suggest new ways to do things, right? Try to find little, like, what's something we could do better around here? What, what's something we could improve? It doesn't have to be the iPhone. It could be something small. Can you get warring teams to work together, right? There's always, every company has these territorial fights where sales fights with engineering and engineering fights with marketing and marketing fights with, you know what I mean? Like everyone is kind of elbowing the other departments out of the way. Like, can you get this team to stop fighting and get them to work together to move forward? Um, so always start be asking yourself, how can we as a company, as an organization be better in some way? And then in your community service activities, um, you know, you, you could, one way to do this is to engage in volunteer work. And so let's talk for a split second. Let me do a little quick aside about the importance of community service. Sometimes people think that community service matters just for the sake of doing community service. Like, oh, it's a box I have to check. Fine, I guess I'll go volunteer at some food pantry. Okay, check, so I can check the box. That's not with the admissions committee. That's not why community service matters. The community service piece matters, first of all, because it shows strong EQ. It shows that you care about other people. But also, a lot of times people are in jobs in very like hierarchical organizations, right? So sometimes I hear people say, Maria, you don't understand. In my company, I'm not allowed to come up with a new way of doing things. Like I would get fired <laughs> if I told my boss that I think we should do things differently. Community service, though, most nonprofit organizations are desperate for talent. They're desperate for good talent. They're desperate for good ideas. So community service is often a place where frustrated leaders can demonstrate their skills. So if you are, if you have done a, a sustained community, and quick thing on community service also, don't do like five different things for one year each. It's better to do one community service activity, but be very deeply involved in it. One activity over five years, as opposed to five activities for one year each. And ideally, it could be something that you even started in college, because then that proves to the admissions committee that you have like a real genuine sustained interest in this topic and helping people with this issue. Um, so go to that nonprofit and don't just show up and volunteer and do the bare minimum because nonprofits are desperate for help. So there you can go and you can say, hey, have we thought about reorganizing the pantry this way? For that new fundraiser, right? What if we what if we added an auction to the fundraiser? Well, could that bring in more money? So that's another that's a place where you can start to prove uh, and start to develop those leadership, you know, those little bits of evidence that are going to prove to the admissions committee that you are a leader. And if you're ever stuck, here's the golden question that will serve you well. This question will not only serve you well for the purposes of your MBA application, but in the rest of your career, the number one question you can ask to win people over is how can I help, right? So if you currently work in finance, let's say, and you want to expand your circle of influence within the company, and let's say like your job is, you know, your job is hard, but you know, frankly, you there's an hour or two each day where you're sort of like not, you don't have a ton to do. Go around to other people in other departments or other people in your own department and say, how can I help? Like, hey, someone in marketing, like, I noticed that you guys are spending a lot of money on Google AdWords. I, I'm really good at Microsoft Excel. Do you want me to like help you analyze that data and try to come up with better AdWords data? Right? Always be asking other people, how can I help? Because that will win you political capital and that political capital will put you in a position to be a leader, both for MBA applications and then life in general. Um, and then in the resume, ways you can prove it is you can use words such as identified, proposed, launched, persuaded, and improved. In the essays, I want you to describe your actions in the first person. This happens a lot also in interviews where people are like, well, so the problem we faced was blah, blah, blah. And so what we did is we did X and then we figured out Y and then we went and did Z. The problem is we are not applying to business school. You or I am applying to business school. So you need to identify very crisply what you did in your essay. Because if you just say my team, my team, my team, then your team's not applying. So how am I as an admissions reader supposed to pick out of that what your actions were and therefore how am I supposed to figure out if you are the one who actually has the leadership skills or maybe it was someone else. Um, and so be sure that you describe, and to do this of course in a in a humble way, right? Not in like the I'm amazing and I walk on water way, but still being humble, walking that fine line between being humble, but also explaining your role. Uh, and I have a lot of advice in Applicant Lab for little tricks on how to do that. Uh, and making sure that there's a clear before and after, right? Because that way it shows that influence. It shows that impact that you've had. So 
don't just describe the outcome of a story. Tell the reader why it matters or like what, you know, what was going wrong at first. So then that way your actions, the impact of your actions, the result of your actions are that much clearer to them. And then in your letters of recommendation, um, I've touched upon, I want your letters to focus on EQ before. I also want your letters of recommendation to make superlative statements, things like, uh, in my 20 years in the software industry, we've never had a product manager who is as strong as you. Um, and your letters are going to reinforce the fact that you have made this positive impact to your organization, right? Your letters are going to back you up on that. And they're going to provide additional detail. Like, you know, did you know, like, she's so, she has so much initiative. She actually went, she works in finance, but she went to the marketing person three months ago and said, hey, I have a few, little bit of extra time. Do you want me to make an Excel spreadsheet to analyze your Google AdWords? Like those little anecdotes can be thrown into the recommendation as proof of your leadership skills. Um, so those are all of my tips for the AdComs hierarchy of needs. If we remember this initial little piece of artwork, um, each of these pieces, the little gears, the little cogs in the gear machine. <laughs> I was not a mechanical engineer, can you tell? Uh, each of these pieces maps to a piece in Applicant Lab. So in Applicant Lab, what I do is I walk you through a series of online exercises and videos that will help you create your strongest application possible so that all of these pieces are flowing together. Just follow my steps, follow my advice, and um, you can save thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. So you don't just have to believe me though. Uh, Applicant Lab won the Harvard Business School New Venture Competition audience favorite vote. Uh, this was a room full of Harvard Business School graduates who had all gone through the admissions process. So when they saw my product, they were like, wow, I wish this product had existed 10 years ago. Uh, I am the only admission service that is endorsed by the Harvest, which is the Harvard Business School student newspaper. And since this is a GMAT Club webinar, uh, read my reviews at GMAT Club. They are all real people. They have all been verified. Their identity has been verified. Um, and so you don't have to take my word for it. The product really works. You can read it there for yourself. So that is my discussion about the adcom hierarchy of needs. Yes, the academic piece is important. If you cannot meet the academic piece, you will not advance. You will not pass go, right? If you play the game Monopoly, you won't pass go. But the academic piece alone is not sufficient. You have to prove these different pieces moving up to the pyramid. The more elite the program is, the stronger that leadership impact at the top of the pyramid needs to be. That's what separates out the person who gets into Stanford from the person who maybe who's very, very strong, who also gets into an excellent, excellent program, but maybe doesn't quite get into like that very tippy top program. What differentiates the people is that leadership piece at the top. I've seen it for, you know, I've seen thousands of applicants in my career. Trust me, that's the thing that separates them. So now when you start thinking about your application process, as we're starting to gear up now, think about what facets, what stories, what parts of yourself are you going to share with the admissions committee that show you being that person? And don't waste your time on things like, I'm very good at SQL. Like, who cares? <laughs> Focus on the things at the top of the pyramid. Okay, so that's my presentation for today. Thank you so much. Did you learn anything today? Was anything interesting? If so, Right, I don't know, I can't see myself, but <laughs> wherever is the like button, give this video a like to let GMAT Club know that you appreciate them uh, convincing me <laughs> to come and give you this presentation today. Uh, and yeah, that is it. I have about 10 minutes left. Let's see, am I still sharing my screen? Or am I, okay, sorry guys, I am, I am sorry about the technical thing. Screen sharing was canceled. Okay, so now can you guys just see me? I don't know, Abhijit, if you're still here. <laughs> I need my co-pilot to help me. Um, I'm gonna assume that I, you guys can still hear and see me. Um, okay, so while I was just giving my presentation, I am looking at my slides. I'm not looking at the comments and questions. So I've got this, I'm in a conference room. I've got this conference room for the next nine minutes at least. So let me see if I can pull up. Oh, hello. Is your camera on? Is my camera on? It is. You can't see me? Can you, you can't, can you see me or not? Hold on. Let me. Yes, 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 yes. No. Oh, okay. You can see me. All right. Would like to take some questions from uh, from there. Yes, yes, I have. We have a little bit of time, and let me look at my um my co-working space app 
to see if anyone uh, claimed this conference room after me. <laughs> but okay, I have at okay. least I have at least nine more minutes before I get kicked out of this room. Okay, awesome. So guys, um, feel free to post any questions you have in the chat box. We'll cover them. Thank you. Abhijit, is my is my video flickering on and off? Oh. For a second there, I, in the little corner, I saw it kind of going like, whoa, flickering, but now it looks normal. Okay. All right, so Shamik is asking, you mentioned don't leave your job for the GMAT, but five months ago, I quit my job to relocate to a different country to be with my family. Okay, so Shamik, that is fine. Uh, you will need to explain that. In most MBA admissions forms, they will say, have you been unemployed for a period of three months or more since graduating from college? If the answer is yes, explain it. So you're going to have to say, you know, we moved to Dubai or we moved to London or wherever it was five months ago. And so it took me some time to find a new job, but then I found a job. Uh, it is it is challenging to get into business school if you are currently unemployed, because how are they supposed to um, judge your leadership accomplishments if you're not currently in an environment where you can be having those leadership accomplishments? So it, it's it's pretty challenging. And also, if somebody has a hard time finding a job because of that employability issue, the admissions officers are going to think to themselves, like, well, is this someone who in general has problems finding a job? Is this person like not a good interviewer or are they not good at networking or whatever? And so it does raise a concern for them because they wanna make sure that you're the sort of person who will get a job and who employers will love. So that way they'll love coming to the campus. Um, so I would urge you to try to get a job as quickly as possible. Uh, and depending on how old you are, you may wanna consider delaying your application by a year. So that way you've got a year's worth of accomplishments at this new job to show when you apply. Ankur wants to know, can late 30s be a no-go? So Ankur, uh, for the U.S. full-time two-year programs, late 30s is usually a no-go. However, there are other programs that exist. Uh, there are one-year programs. So uh, London, Bus London Business School, MIT, and Stanford um, all have one-year programs that are for more seasoned executives. Cornell Business School has a one-year program that you are able to apply for if you already have some other master's degree or something like the C some sort of equivalence like a CPA, CFA, et cetera, I think. Um, and Columbia Business School has uh, something called the J-Term, which is a condensed version of the MBA program where there is no summer internship. So that tends to be more open to older candidates as well. And the European programs do tend to be open to older candidates as well. Uh, in terms of the elite U.S. schools, in my experience, it is possible to get in in your late 30s, of course. When have I seen that, though? It's usually, let me think, my husband had a, in his section, he had a um, someone who was sort of in his, I think, mid-30s at the time. And he was, he had been like some highly decorated combat helicopter pilot who won the uh, oh gosh, I'm I'm so sorry, military people. I might butcher this. The Distinguished Flying Cross, I think, is the award that he won. It's basically like one of the highest award. It's a very rare military award. He won it, and he had led people into battle in Afghanistan, and you know. So so that guy got in in his mid 30s. But when you look at his leadership potential, holy smokes, it was amazing. So. Yeah, you know that people, uh, other people who get into business school in their thirties, for example, if they pursued a PhD program for several years, they might have better luck. But if you are in your late thirties, usually you probably won't get into a two-year program. And really quickly, why is that? Is it because they're ageist and they just don't like older people? Urgh. No, it's not that. It's because of the career outcomes. Most people who are in their late 30s, if we think about the average starting salary of business school graduates, most people in their late 30s are usually far beyond that earning power. So who the school thinks to itself, well, if we let them in and then they get a job as like a post MBA job as like a product manager or as like an associate at McKinsey, that's going to be a big step back for them. So they're not going to be happy and we want people to be happy. Uh, and then conversely, if you're like, well, I'm not at that level yet, they're going to think to themselves, what's wrong with this person that they haven't gotten promoted, like they're already in their late 30s and they haven't moved up the ladder, right? That also makes them worried about employability. So that employability piece is a big reason why older candidates have a hard time. 
If someone is basing a job in US based on CF a and CPA and other certifications, but interested in an MBA to develop and polish those managerial skills. Is that a positive for B-School? So look, the CFA and CPA are useful things to have in general, right? You're, you're, you know, <laughs> as much as, as much as I hate to admit it, knowing accounting actually is pretty useful. Ugh, I don't like it, but it's something I need to get better at. Um, so it's a useful thing. And it's certainly, it doesn't hurt. It certainly helps, but someone, with, let's say this hypothetical, someone with a CFA and, I don't know, a 650 GMAT is not going to do as well in this process as someone without a CFA and a 750 GMAT, if you know what I mean. Like, it counts for something, but it's also common enough that, like, it's like, oh, that's interesting, huh? Um, but it's not, if you, let me put it this way. Here's how I'm going to put it. If you've got six months left between now and when you plan to take the test, and with those six months of your time, you can either get that CFA charter or you can study for the GMAT, study for the GMAT, that's going to have more impact in, in your candidacy because it's a standardized test, as I explained before. Any other questions? Any other questions? Let me see. Let me. What happens if I click over here? Live comments. Uh, Abjit, do you want me to? Do you want me to pick up some of these comments? I think I don't see anyone. <laughs> Sometimes when when someone has the the conference room next, you can see people like hovering. I don't see anyone hovering, so I think I've got a few more minutes. Um, Okay, can you talk a little about the number of years of work experience? Any disadvantage for applicants with less years of work experience? So. Just like being too old is not great, being too young is also not great. And why is that? Think about the employability factor. If I am Goldman Sachs or I am McKinsey and I am coming to a business school campus, I am recruiting this MBA talent. I expect this MBA talent to have a certain level of executive polish that is, I can put them in front of a CEO and they will present effectively. They will be able to manage uh, relationships with high level clients effectively. They will have had enough experience that my clients will be impressed that I put them, you know, I put this associate in front of them. So sometimes the younger candidates who really don't have a lot of experience, if they get into business school, they may not have the same positive recruiting outcome, right? Because an employer is going to say, well, you know, I, uh, you know, I've, I've got five spots for my firm that I'm going to, I'm going to hire five kids from this school this year. And one of them has like a 760 on the GMAT and has five years of experience and managed a team of 10 and led the development of a new product. And the other one has a lot of high potential, super high potential, also 750 on the GMAT, whatever. But well, they didn't really do as much because not because the younger candidate doesn't have the potential to be amazing, but because they simply have not been able to prove it yet. And so the reason why slightly older candidates have the advantage, I was actually recently talking to someone who worked at, who only had like two or three years of experience and they were applying from a major, one of the most famous technology companies in the world. And they were not having success this season. And then I was like, well, I actually have other clients from that same company because it's a big company. So lots of people apply. And they have had success at these higher programs. And I said, these other people have about two to three years more experience than you. And so when I look at the resume bullet points, you know, you're talking about maybe helping contribute to a project. They are leading the project. You talk about like, oh, maybe I got to present my idea to a director on their resume. It says I got to present to the CEO and it's a famous, like a world famous CEO. So that's a big deal. So that's why younger candidates are usually at a disadvantage, not because you don't have potential to do great things in your life, but just because you haven't had a chance to prove it yet. When do younger candidates have success? Usually if you have a family business, because then I don't need to worry about your employability because I know dad's going to hire you. That's usually. Or a younger candidate can have success in this process if their accomplishments are on par with the accomplishments of people who have had four or five years experience. So there are some people who do get in. I did have someone with only two years of work experience get into HBS this year, but this person was like a star in their company. And, 
you know, had been, t- had been like promoted to like a post MBA role, uh, like one year out of college. And their recommender basically said like, I've never promoted someone this young to this job. And he, you know, he's like seven years younger than the other people in this role, but he's amazing. Uh, so that person did get into Harvard. So just realize if you're younger, it's that much harder. You're going to be, you're going to be compared against, uh, people who have probably accomplished more. So keep that in mind. All right. What's the next question? Any others? Let me pull some, let me see if I can pull some up over here. Mm -hmm. Um, Someone named Legend Awesome says, won't a high GMAT score contradict a low GPA? That is exactly what I said. If you remember the slide with the little, it had a little seesaw. (laughs) It was done in PowerPoint shape, so it's not like a super artistic thing, but it was supposed to be a seesaw. Remember where I had the GPA was slanted downwards and then the next, boom, the GMAT came and it balanced it out. GMAT will always be more important than GPA for the reasons I described earlier, because it is a standardized measure of your academic aptitude. Gonzalo Morales, quiere saber, are there any advantages for Latin American candidates to European B-schools? Or is it easier for US business schools? You know, Gonzalo, I think that, I do think that there's a little bit, and I don't have any sci- thing, anything sort of scientific to prove this, but I do think I've seen a little bit more success with the European programs. Um, I don't know if that's because maybe it's, I don't know if it's easier to get a work visa in Europe if you're from Latin America. I'm not sure why. Uh, and also because the European programs, as I mentioned before, they tend to be a little bit more open to those older candidates. And people from Latin America, sometimes they do tend to wait a couple of years more to apply. Um, so I have seen that, but I would not let that necessarily dissuade you from applying to U.S. programs. So apply to, I always advise applying to at least six programs every round to like, if you want to kind of divide them out like this two like dream schools, uh, two kind of like schools where you're like, okay, I, I think I can do this. And then if you really, really want to enroll next year, then two sort of more safety schools, right? Where you're sort of, your stats are way above uh, the average. Let's see, should I go through and try to find some more? Okay. Oh, someone just asked how to apply for a PhD program. Um, PhD program is a completely different, different, completely different from MBA. A PhD is an academic degree. You are getting a PhD to be able to do research and to teach. So for your application, the hierarchy of needs is different. You need to prove that you are good at teaching and that you are good at generating theory in your field. Uh, so that way you will become published and you will become famous. Um, someone, I am 40 years old in a combat role trying for Stanford one year MBA. What are the chances? It really depends. Pida. Oh, look, if I click on it, does it appear on the screen? Is that what happens? I'm experimenting. I hope I don't crash everything. Um, anyways, I see here, someone says I'm 40 in a combat role. Um, I can't tell you what your chances are because I have no idea. I don't know where you stand at the pyramid. I don't know if you're in a combat role and if you're leading combat and if you've been somehow a real star. Uh, in combat, like if your government has honored you with one of the nation's top honors, uh, and if you have, you know, sort of a very clear reason and a clear path forward for your career of why an MBA makes sense. Uh, Because remember, part of it also is that they don't want you, you know, if you take out 170,000 US dollars, 150,000, 200,000 US dollars loan to get this MBA, they want to make sure that you'll be able to pay it back. Uh, the head of financial aid at Tuck, Dartmouth Tuck, once said something that was like, we don't want to let in someone. We, we don't want to ruin someone's life financially. So we don't want to let someone in and have them go 200,000 US dollars into debt and then have that debt throw them their families into bankruptcy. So if you've got a clear path forward as to how that MBA program makes sense for you and how you're going to leverage it to advance in your career, then 
you might have a great chance, but it's hard to tell. That's why whenever people do like, here my chance, like what's my GPA, my GMAT, and what do you think my chances are? That's why it, this entire presentation is is telling you why I cannot make that sort of a, I can't, I, I would need to know where you are at the top of the pyramid. Um, are reapplicants at a disadvantage because of multiple GMAT and interview attempts? Yes. Yes. Uh, so I have like a weird kind of mental flow chart for reapplicants. Because your personality matters so much to an admissions committee in terms of who are you going to be on the campus? Who are you going to be after school? Here's my rule. Assuming that everything else is competitive, right? If you're from an overrepresented group, is your GMAT above the average? Do you have this same, you know, same right years of work experience? Or have you had that sort of leadership impact at your organization that is on par with other students in that program? Assuming that all the rest of that is fine. If you apply and are not interviewed, I think people then have better chances as reapplicants. If you apply somewhere, are interviewed, and are then rejected, you have a much harder chance because there's a chance that something in that interview, something about your personality was off to the interviewer. And that note is going to be like, seemed a little arrogant or very insecure, right? So they're going to say something about your personality in the interview notes. And so the next year, they're going to, the admissions committee is going to reference those interview notes. And they're going to say, well, you know, someone's job might have changed in a year, but someone's personality doesn't change in a year. So if somebody blows it in the interview for a school, usually a, any reapplication to that school will be futile. But yes, look, if you, if you, uh, you know, if you've taken the GMAT 10 times, they're going to, they're probably going to see that, right? And they're going to think, and the GMAC itself, the organization that issues the GMAT, I think they've shown that after the fourth test or after the third test, very few people have massive improvements. So most people who take it 10 times don't, they have these little incremental improvements, but they usually don't like jump hundred points. So at a certain point, Retaking by itself is not a bad thing because it you know, if you did poorly the first time, it shows tenacity. It shows the admissions committee that you are, you know, I don't give up and I work hard and I try again. Uh, but at a certain point, if you've taken it like 10 times, they're going to think, whoa, <laughs> right? So at a certain point, um, reapplicants are at a disadvantage. But that having been said, 10% of each class at Harvard Business School are that is accepted each year are were previously applicants. So uh, there is hope but you have to show a very clear progression between the last time you applied and now, either in your GMAT score or in your professional accomplishments to prove like, okay, when I applied before, maybe I wasn't great, but now look at me, look at what I've done. Mm, someone was asking, is it really, is, am I really at a serious disadvantage if I take a break to prepare for the GMAT? Yes, yes, you are. I don't know how to, it's a very, it's a very, if you tell an admissions committee in the US, I quit my job to study for the GMAT, that is going to go over so poorly <laughs> because everyone else, you know, I was working whatever, 60 hours a week when I prepped for the GMAT and I was able to get a high score. And everyone else, like the consultants, the management consultants and the investment bankers, especially who work 100 hour work weeks, they're somehow able to study for the GMAT and get a high score. So they, so if somebody can't handle working and studying at the same time, they're going to think, well, this person can't handle that on our campus. And it's also unfair, right? So if somebody quits their job, studies for the GMAT, and gets a high score, the admissions committee is going to look at that and be like, well, but it's not apples to apples, right? Because this person had 12 hours a day to study, and everyone else had only two hours a day to study. So that high score will be diminished in their eyes because of that unfair advantage that you got uh, from 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 quitting your job and because being in a job lets you advance up that hierarchy of needs. Two months, three months, six months on a job gives you more opportunities for leadership than the GMAT score will. So it's better for your candidacy all around. Just don't quit. Okay, Kim is asking, if you've left your job two months ago and are in the midst of interviewing for another job, Will the fact that you don't have a job at that point in time be a deal breaker? So Kim, it won't necessarily be a deal breaker. Um, you know, usually, uh, well, let's, let's see. If, you, if you're talking about yourself, Kim, that means that you quit your job, let's say in we're now in March. So let's say that you quit your job in December or March. 
But if you're interviewing right now, then let's say you get a job, let's call it April. So April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, you will have had nine months of work. If assuming that you apply round two, you will have had nine months of work uh, at the time of applying. So, you know, you're not applying now because there are no applications. I mean, maybe INSEAD is open now. They have sort of year round admissions, but for most of the programs don't have admissions now. So, um, you know, usually I think admissions committee from an employability standpoint, like that people like to find people who first, who don't quit a job until they first have another job lined up. Uh, they, they sort of view that as being a more prudent course of action. Um, but two months is not terrible to find a new job. It's fine. It's, it's sort of at the three month mark and above that they start to get curious. Okay. Let me see. There are some people here who are asking like very specific questions to their particular candidacy. And I don't think it's, I'm trying to answer questions that I think might be more, um, generally applicable so that everyone in the audience benefits. Okay. Wow, there's a lot of a lot of comments. Sorry, I'm trying to I'm trying to uh Senor Coney says three hundred dollars per hour. Holy bleep. Yep. The other admissions consulting firms, their one school packages help with one school starts at around four thousand eight hundred dollars. So between four thousand to five thousand dollars, and quickly escalates from there. Applicant Lab is videos of me, just like the video you saw today. If you thought it was useful, guess what? There's a lot more where that came from at applicantlab.com. It is three hundred dollars, uh, and so it comes with everything, all the pieces of the application. My advice for all of it is in that product because I am trying to level the playing field for people who don't have four, six, twelve thousand dollars to spend. Uh, and if you like this lesson, again, please give a. Uh, it's opposite, right? So I, my hands are moving one direction, but on the screen, they're moving the other direction. I think it's down there is the like button. Let's see. Or dislike button too. Hey, give me the feedback. Happy to, happy to take it. Sorry, guys. Scrolling, 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 scrolling. Somebody posted, I got rejected from ISB with a 720 GMAT after interview. Yeah. So I use, if that was you, like, uh, yeah, that's, Assuming that a 720 is a competitive score for ISB, then chances are something higher up in that pyramid uh, won't, you know, so, something up there didn't quite jive with them. Uh, oh, someone asked, this is a good question. For the MBA, which GPA do business schools pay more attention to, your undergraduate GPA or your graduate school GPA? Great question. It is the undergraduate GPA that tends to matter more. And that is because most graduate programs have a lot of grade inflation. And that means that it's easier to get A's in a graduate program than it is to get A's in an undergraduate program. That having been said, if your undergraduate, for whatever, chance, for whatever reason, was not great, and then you went on to graduate school and you turned it around, you can absolutely make that argument to them that like, look, I got to college for whatever reason, blah, blah, blah. I wasn't ready. I didn't do my best. But then later in graduate school, I picked it up and then I, you know, I, I turned it around and I picked up my performance and, um, you know, look at my GMAT score. It's so high. So that's a good show of my, that's a good proof of my intellectual ability. You can totally make up for it. And by the way, guys, the GMAT, a high GMAT's not the only way to make up for a low GPA. Every school has something called the optional essay or optional information, or they call it something different. In the optional essay, let's say you had some tragedy, some personal tragedy that impacted you in the middle of your collegiate studies and you had to drop out of school or you failed a semester or you failed a class. You can explain that. Don't fear like, oh, they're just going to look at my grades. And I, you, if only they knew that such and such thing happened to me. No, they're going to know. They're going to know because you can tell them. So don't panic if you're like, oh, but my, my dad lost his job and I had to drop out of college because I couldn't afford it anymore. Like, don't worry. They're human. You can explain that stuff. Um, oh, see, somebody asked, is a 3.5 GPA considered a low GPA? 
your username is Lactutor. Uh, I would ask you, Lactutor, what do you think based on what we talked about? I think I gave an example saying that not all GPAs are created equal, right? So I can't tell you if a three point if, if it's a three point five from IIT and you were the number one person, you know, in your electrical neurobiology AI department, then it's great. Uh, if it's a three five in finger painting <laughs> from a no name college that is not a competitive college and no one's ever heard of it and it's a silly easy major, then it's not a high GPA. So the context matters. Okay, scrolling. Oh, so it's the person I think. I think you're the person who asked before about moving and not having a job because of visa issues. Yeah, that's fine. Just explain to them, like trying to find a job, but can't get a visa. Um, you know, it does, it does beg the question if you're having a hard time, I'm guessing you moved with a significant other who does have a work visa. Is that what's happening? Are they like on an H1B, H1B1 or whatever that's called? Uh, and then you can't work. That's such a stupid policy. A, a spouse can get a visa to work, but then the spouse that follows them can't get a visa to work. <sighs> so stupid. Um, so Shamik, I'm sorry, if that's the case, then yeah, you can explain it. I will say though, if you have nine plus years of experience, maybe the one year MBA programs are the better ones for you to look at just because that is a little bit old, a little bit old for the two year programs. Uh, okay, I think I did younger applicants I already talked about. High GMAT score contradicts the low GPA talked about. Reapplicants I talked about. Can I explain my essays in an interview, says Pritam. Um, well, first of all, hopefully you don't have to explain your essays. Your essays should be written well enough that they don't need explanation. Uh, you can tell the same story in an interview that you told in an essay, assuming it's a blind interview. Blind means that they have not read your application. It means that the interviewer has only read your essay, uh, sorry, has only read your resume prior to the interview. Uh, so in that case, if you wrote about something in an essay, there's a really good chance that the interviewer doesn't know about it. So then of course you can talk about the same example. Um, but if you're thinking to yourself while you write your essay, well, this essay is not that clear, but I'll just wait till the interview to clear it up. No, it, <laughs> you, you won't get that chance. Right? Because they'll say, well, we don't understand what this person did. So we're not going to invite them to interview. Okie doke. Ankur is asking me, what should be focused on most to secure scholarships? Aha. So scholarships. Scholarships are available. They are not as common as you think. In Applicant Lab, I have a to-do list module. And one of my to-do items is think about the financing. Look at how much a school costs and ask yourself, am I willing to take out loans to get this degree? Because every year, there are a lot more scholarships available in general around the world for undergraduate study and for other types of graduate study and not MBAs. Because let's say I'm a university and I, you're entering my PhD program for infectious disease, right? You're going you're gonna, to um, you're gonna find a cure for COVID-19, right? I, as a university, will fund your education because you are pursuing an education that is going to go on to have a greater good. People who pursue MBAs, some of them do pursue lives and careers that go on to have a greater good, but a lot of them don't. A lot of them end up making money. And so a university thinks to itself, well, I don't need to fund this person's education because they're going to go on to make money. <laughs> so why should I give them a break? So scholarships happen. Yes, they do. They are not as common. You cannot, cannot bank on it. Once again, the past several weeks, every year it happens. I put it in the to-do section for a reason. Every year. I get emails, Maria, I've been accepted to London Business School. I've been accepted to Tepper. I've been accepted to whatever, but I didn't get a scholarship. What am I supposed to do? You're supposed to take out a loan. That's what you're supposed to do. Um, it's sort of, it's, you know, I, I give this advice because people don't seem to realize that scholarships are available, but they are not as like plentiful as they were earlier in our academic careers. Now, if you do want to maximize your chances of getting a scholarship, because that's like really important to you, the easiest way I can tell you is apply to a school that has an average GMAT score that's like, I don't know, 80, 100 points lower than yours. That means you're going to go to a lower ranked school. 
but a lower ranked school in order to attract people with high GMAT scores. So that way that elevates their average GMAT score. So therefore they elevate themselves in the rankings. They may be willing to throw money at you to bring you, uh, to bring you to end your GMAT score to their cohort and their statistics. So if that's really important, I would say aim for lower schools where your GMAT is like, wow, like amazing. And they'll be like, okay. Okay, hold on, sorry, still scrolling. Be patient. I wish I had like elevator music noise, like do 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 do. Please hold while I please hold while I scan your comments. Uh, someone asked, I started my first job four months after graduating college. Do I need to explain that? Excellent question, Paul. No, you do not need to explain that. A lot of employers, the banks, the consulting firms, you know, they'll usually say to kids, like, okay see you in October, right? Like you're graduating from college, take the summer off, see you in October or see you in September or whatever. So that's very common. If it's like right after school and it was lay, say less than six months, I think you're cool. I don't think you have to. Someone's asking me a question on the GMAT exam. I am not a GMAT pro. I focus on a different part of things. So I'm not a GMAT expert. Is applying through the GRE a disadvantage? It is, it is not. Um, can you defer your admissions if you get an admit? Usually you cannot. That's why the business schools will often say, why is now the right time for you to get an MBA? So if you get in and then you're like, oops, I actually want to come in a year, you will have to reapply. The only times I have ever seen anyone get a deferment is for medical reasons. Uh, for example, uh, my mother just got cancer, heaven forbid, but my, you know, and, and so she's dying. And so I want to spend the next six months with her and not enroll in your school. I've seen that work or I've seen, I have cancer and I need to go through chemotherapy. So I can't enroll, but can I enroll next year? Assuming I survive, I've seen that work and I've seen a pregnancy work. I just found out that I'm pregnant. I'm about to give birth in October, which is right when classes, you know, September, October, which is right when classes start. I don't want to have a newborn and start business school at the same time. Can I defer a year? Yes. Aside from that, deferrals are usually not granted and you will be told to reapply the following year. Can I do my GMAT exam two years before applying? Yes. GMAT scores are valid for five years. I'm above 30 and have, see, this is where people put like, I'm above 30 and I've got four years of big four experience and two years of this. I, I need to know so much more because of that pyramid. So, uh, I will say normally the older you are, if you are above 30, it is, it is harder to get in. Uh, but it's certainly doable. So don't let that dissuade you. All right. GMAT club. I think we can wrap up here, Maria. Wonderful. Thanks, Abhijit. Thanks everyone for your patience. I know we had like the sort of technical difficulty at the beginning. Lesson learned. I will use Chrome from now on. Uh, and thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Again, if anything I said here, was new or interesting or useful for you, give me a like and I'll see you guys next time. Thank you so much.